Hello and welcome to this AEI book forum with Roosevelt Montas about his new book, Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation. I'm Benjamin Story, and I'm going to be joined uh, in this conversation with Roosevelt Montas today by my wife and co-author, Jenna Silberstory. We're both visiting fellows in the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Division of the American Enterprise Institute, and we're also both professors at Furman University, where we direct Furman's Tocqueville program. Today's event is part of AEI's Edward and Helen Hintz Book Forum series. These forums provide a platform to host prominent authors for discussion of new books on issues of national significance. We're very grateful to Edward and Helen Hintz for their tremendous support of AEI and deep commitment to our mission. Uh, at the end of today's uh, conversation, we'll have some time for your questions. You can email those questions at any time during the conversation to Jackson Walford at jacksonwalford uh, at AEI.org. You can see the uh, email address at the bottom of your screen there, or you can tweet them to us <clears throat> at our hashtag rescuing Socrates AEI. Our guest today is Roosevelt Montas. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in American Studies and English at Columbia University, and he's the director of Columbia's Freedom and Citizenship Program. For 10 years, uh, Professor Montas served as director of the Center for the Core Curriculum, which oversees Columbia's famous Great Books Program. So Roosevelt Montas, welcome to AEI. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here with both of you. So Rescuing Socrates is a defense of the kind of education offered in Columbia's core curriculum. And that form of education, as you point out, is embattled now and, in fact, has always been embattled the, uh, since the, its, uh, its very invention. So it, the, the book is also an autobiography and tells the story of how your own life was inflected by the kind of education that Columbia's core that Columbia's Columbia's core offers. And it's worth noting here that you're not only on the faculty at Columbia; that is the institution at which you got both your your undergraduate and your graduate education. So why don't we begin by just considering what it is that you mean by great books education? What is it, and what purpose does it serve? Thank you. You know, that very category, great books, has become contested. And um, it's a, to a layperson may seem a remarkable thing that many, maybe the dominant um, opinion of literature professors is that there is no such thing as a great book. Um, but that phrase also has a kind of a kind of history. There is a there was a great books movement. Um, there are, there are schools that self identify as uh, offering great books curricula. Um, but loosely speaking, great books um, is one way of naming works from our past that have had a an outsized influence on the way the world is today. That is, works in literature, philosophy, uh, other forms of art, visual arts, uh, music, works that have impacted the world in such a way that we can trace their, their influence. We can see the ways in which they have put into circulation debates, categories, questions, positions that have, uh, have shaped the world today. Um, we, you, typically, that category, great books, overlaps significantly with, with what people call the classics. Sometimes it, they simply call them uh, the canon. Um, often it's associated with the West uh, because the, the West has, from very early on, uh, engaged in various intellectual projects to form canons, to, to select and curate bodies of knowledge as embodied in texts that have particular authority. And of course, um, the, the, the salient example of this is the biblical canon, um, which collects a, a set of texts that are given special authority. So that's sort of the model that, that comes to shape the, the idea of great books. But today we simply, um, and I simply, 
think of great books as, as works from the past that command our attention, works from the past whose study and consideration shed special light on the way the world is today and shed special light on questions that are perennial in the human experience. So when did this great books style of education as it's come to be practiced here in the United States, when did it come into existence and why? Columbia um, gets, uh, gets a lot of the credit. Um, so, and, and it's, it's an interesting and peculiar institutional history. Columbia College, um, which obviously remains to this day and is the original college founded in 1754, founded as, a, as an Anglican um, kind of uh, sectarian school. Uh, but eventually evolves through the colonial period into independence. And by the time you get to the 19th century, the research universities emerging and around Columbia College, there emerge uh, different faculties and a, and a whole um, large institution that's devoted to the research model. Um, and uh, Columbia's president, Nicholas Pottery Butler, comes in at the very beginning of the 20th century to um, with with a really explicit vision of turning Columbia into a research colossus, and um, the college begins to be very much neglected. And Nicholas Murray Butler, and as well as many other university leaders, um, in fact, sought to to eliminate, to yeah. abolish the college, turn it into some kind of pre-professional feeder for the graduate school. And it was in response to a kind of institutional marginalization that Columbia College um, embraced and, 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 and emphasized, it kind of doubled down in its liberal mission, in its non-professionalizing mission. It mm -hmm. kind of put down stakes as a school that was going to focus on the cultivation and maturation of individuals without a professional end. To this day, Columbia College does not give bachelors of science degrees. All the degrees it gives are bachelors of arts. At the center of that vision, of that commitment of the college to the individual student rather to, than to the research disciplines that were arising, at the center of that was the core curriculum, was this um, uh, initially a course offered called General Honors that proposed the then radical idea. This is 1919, we're talking, 1920, proposing the radical idea that undergraduates read one great work in translation every week and treat it as if it was a work that had just recently been published, treat it as a kind of, um, you know, the latest, uh, the latest novel or the latest work in the culture and, and, and talk about it, think about it, critique it with the same kind of freshness and relevance. And that, that idea... Uh, was radical then and it continues to be radical. But but that mm -hmm. course um, first offered as a as a as an advanced seminar by the mid 30s became the required seminar for all first year students, beginning with Homer's Iliad and moving chronologically through roughly speaking the Western canon to contemporary to contemporary works. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you first uh, encountered this form of education and, and how it's come to inflect your life. No, I arrived at Columbia um, as a first year student. I, I went there for college and, and I arrived there with a kind of pretty thorough naivete, to put it mildly or, or more, more directly of saying it would be ignorance um, about, about college life, about curricula about liberal education. Um, I did not know what the core curriculum was, uh, th this program that, that was there waiting for me. Um, I did have a very decisive encounter with what we would call a, a great book, with, with the, uh, a fixture of the great book canon. Uh, while in high school, um, I had emigrated from the Dominican Republic to New York City um, shortly before I was 12. I didn't speak English lived uh, with, with my mother and brothers, a single mother, uh, very, very difficult kind of material conditions, um, struggling uh, as many other poor immigrants have done and do. Um, and I came across a, a book that my next door neighbors have thrown out. They threw out, they kind of did some, some kind of house cleaning and rid themselves of a lot of books, among which 
was a volume I picked up of Plato's dialogues um, surrounding the trial and death of Socrates. Um, and I started reading that in, in a kind of earnest, in, with, a, with a kind of um, intensity. And um, that book mediated a very important relationship in my high school. Uh, um, a social studies teacher was Greek himself, had been an immigrant himself, had had a classical education at Princeton. So I'm in the hallway reading this book and invited me to come after school and, and, and talk to him about it. And that began a mentorship that has been one of the most important relationships in, in my life. He continues to be one of my closest friends. Um, so when I got to Colombia, um, I had had already this encounter with great books, but I had no clue about what a liberal education or just a general education, broadly speaking, focused on the study of such books would mean. Um, and uh, just to, to add one other, one, one other aspect to, to my relationship, um, when I arrived at Columbia, I had been in the United States six years. Uh, my English was barely good enough to be admitted to Columbia. My, my sense of fluency in the social norms, in the kind of culture, youth culture, broader American culture was sorely, sorely deficient. Um, and that first year at Columbia was a, a very difficult time, a bewildering time, a disorienting time. And reading those books, beginning with the Iliad and the Odyssey and Sophocles, Euripides and Thucydides and Herodotus um, and Dante and Shakespeare and Don Quixote, reading those books was the primary way through which I began to orient myself vis-a-vis -vis this world that I was encountering and vis-a-vis -vis my own development, vis-a-vis -vis my own coming of age, my own sense of myself as, a, as an individual, as an agent, as a member of American society, as a member of a democratic society. So I forged a sense of myself and, and kind of saw my way through what seemed an impenetrable maze, drawing on those books in a, in a quite um, decisive and indispensable way. Mm. I just want to quickly comment that um, for those who haven't read the book, it's it, it really is this wonderful mix of philosophic meditation and memoir. And in particular, the story of young Roosevelt Montas finding uh, this copy of Plato's dialogues in a trash pile. It's uh, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you tell the story there, this was part of uh, the famous five foot shelf of books published by Charles Eliot. And you describe how this is a good business venture. It, you know, it sold a lot of copies, but I thought, you know, and m many of which were never read, of course. They just right. sat on the shelves and wealthy people. Including sold. the ones I picked up, they had clearly never been opened. The spines never cracked. I have a few of those. I've never cracked the spines. <laughs> <laughs> I read paperbacks, but the, uh, but that story of you finding Plato in the trash pile, it's like, uh, yeah, it makes the whole thing worthwhile. The whole enterprise of publishing these, uh, the, this five foot shelf. That's what it's, that's what it's for. Thank you. You know, I, I, I remark in the book that one of the things back in the Dominican Republic that you hear about, about New York and um, most, especially back in the eighties, most immigrants to the United States from the Dominican Republic came to New York. And, and in fact, in the Dominican Republic, Nueva York, New York just stands for the whole country. You know, people mm -hmm. live in California and they say they live in Nueva York. Um, just all of the United States just, just get just gets identified as Nueva York. But one of the amazing things that people will return from New York saying is that people, Americans throw away perfectly good stuff all the time. You can pick up TVs, dressers, beds, air conditioners, all kinds of things that uh, you can pick up from the street. It's treasure, some of which might require some minor repair, but, but it was, you could kind of live off just picking up good stuff that people throw away and um you know when i when i encountered that those books uh, it has turned out that 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 was that was the treasure that i um came to america to find uh, my my mother sacrificed very profoundly her life her her, her independence her agency uh her relationships her family in the dominican republic to come here with one single purpose, which was to open a way for my brother and I to have a shot at growing up and living in the United States. Um, and as it turns out, the thing that uh, the treasure that that sacrifice ended up leading me to was contained between those covers in that book and, and the world that reading that book, engaging with those ideas, 
initiating the, the, the development, inner and outer, outer development that that, that that book initiated, that turned out to be uh, worth all the sacrifice. Hmm. Jenna. Good. Well, I think I'll ask one more um, question about your personal story before we turn to other things. Um, as you describe your first, as you were describing your first days at Columbia, I was wondering what advice you would give to a young person in a situation like you were in when you were starting out in, in, in this university where so much was uh, new to you, confusing to you. Um, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? I think where I would put, where I would direct um, a student kind of in my situation immediately is to find people with whom they have a, a connection. That is to seek out mentors and people who have a personal interest in them. Um, and this is, I guess I should, I should preface that with saying, this is assuming you're in a liberal arts context. Um, so that, that would be the first thing. If I get to speak to them before they arrive in college, I would steer them towards either a university or a college uh, that has a commitment to liberal education because liberal education is about the cultivation of individuals. Liberal education takes the individual in his or her existential condition as a development, developing, unfolding, growing, organic agent and attends to that. Liberal education concerns itself not with turning this individual into a scholar, into a professional, um, but simply cultivating those human capacities that are innate in the individual. So liberal education is premised on, um, on relationship. Liberal education is, is something that happens between people, um, not something that happens between, between people and books. So I would say um, have as, as clear a, a vision that your education, your liberal education, is going to be funneled through relationships and seek out those relationships. So find the people that 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 resonate with you. Go to the go to office hours. Mm -hmm. um, seek out those, those those relationships. Okay, thank you. All right. So as my husband mentioned, your book is a very complex interweaving of your of your personal story, and also a polemical critique of. Uh, what's going wrong with education today. So what would you say is is the main thrust of that polemical, polemical critique? What is the main object? One way to put it would be that the dominance of disciplinary research and study in the university has squeezed out general education and has squeezed out this traditional purpose of the university that had to do with the cultivation of human beings. Um, even places that call themselves liberal education, um, that, that call themselves liberal arts colleges and that, that do liberal education, in so many of those places, what, what is meant by liberal education is introduction to the liberal arts disciplines. So introduction to literature or art history or philosophy, um, history, music, uh, but an introduction that is already so bound inside disciplinary specialization inside specialized questions, specialized vocabulary, scholarly elaborations um, within those disciplines. And that, um, that has actually obviated, that has uh, undermined in some way what a liberal education means. A liberal education is decidedly non-disciplinary, right? A liberal education concerns our condition as free, self-determining individuals. A liberal education is um, not subjected to a scholarly, um, even a research goal, but simply to the full development of human capacities inherent in every individual. And that's why liberal education is appropriate uh, as a foundation for any profession. So one of the one of the features of this squeezing out of liberal of true liberal education from from the dominance of by the dominance of disciplinary specialization. One of the features of that is that today we often think that in order to get a liberal education, you have to major in the liberal arts so that people think of, well, you're either going to be an art historian or an engineer. You're going to be a, a literary critic or a, or a struggling academic or a computer programmer. So that liberal education has come to be offered as, a, as, as one among many specialties. Um, but that is an oxymoron. Liberal education is in fact 
that fundamental type of cultivation and education that equips you to fulfill any particular professional role to its maximum potential. So to be the best engineer or the best businessman or the best doctor, the best scientist, there is a kind of human cultivation, a kind of human formation that uh, forms the basis of that, of that specialization, a, a framing of the question, a grounding of what those um, endeavors mean in the broader social context. So a liberal education ought to be the foundation for every profession rather than one particular track you can follow. So to, to kind of circle back to, to the beginning of my answer, one way to summarize the critique I make of the contemporary university is that the dominance of disciplinary specialization has in fact undermined the practice of liberal education. Okay, uh, that, that's that's very interesting. I think your book has been received in a way that um, indicates that that was part of your polemic. Um, but another angle that has been picked up I think, uh, involves um, your potential response to the critique that the study of great books is not really, as you say, a way to fundamentally equip all sorts of people for lives of meaning and excellence, right? But a tool of, um, a, tool of a particular culture that aims to place certain people on top, generally white, um, wealthy people, mm -hmm. and to keep others down, right? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of the way that your book has been received has, has has started an interesting argument in that domain. I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit more um, about that potential polemical angle of your book. Thank you. Um, yes, well, you know, there is a, a historical association between higher education and, and, and elitism, higher education and the maintenance of hierarchical structures of domination, subordination, exploitation. Um, higher education has been for most of its existence um, the province of a social and cultural elite. One of the great achievements of America um, has been the democratization of higher education. Um, and that's something that really begins um, pretty late in the, in, in the kind of inklings of it in the 20th century, but really gets going after the Second World War with passage of the, of the um, GI Bill. Um, even, you know, sometimes I, I, I recall Moby Dick, um, published in 1850, where when Ishmael is about to board the Pequod um, to go on this whaling voyage, and he meets the owners of the Pequod, and they kind of are ready to sign him up. And they say, you know, have you heard of this, of this captain who runs this ship, Ahab? And Ishmael has never heard of him. But um, they say of, of, of Ahab as a way of pointing to his peculiarity, his strangeness, this, this unusual enigmatic character is that he has been to colleges as well as among the savages. It's like going to college was probably as weird as living among the savages, right? Uh, so, so there is this, this exclusivity about, about college education. And college education, until the rise of the research university, was very much something like liberal education, was very much an education in classical learning, often, often emphasizing the, the classical languages. So there is this historical association between liberal education and elite forms of social power. Um, today, the whole uh, thrust of higher education is, is, is a democratizing one. It is the fact that no longer are we going to use higher education as a kind of, as a kind of sieve, as a kind of uh, selection and cultivation of a social elite, but we in fact are going to do our very best to universalize that experience. And, and that, is, that is really deeply embedded in the whole idea of a democratic society. A democratic society requires participants who have the tools with which to engage in self-governance. So the liberal education that was once for the social elite, for the people who ran the society, must today be general universal education to the extent that we aspire to, a, to being a democracy. We must as aspire to liberal education for all. Um, so I, I argue that instead of, it, of liberal education being a tool for elitism, instead of liberal education being a tool for the preservation of a certain kind of hierarchical form of, 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 of domination, Liberal education is the most powerful tool that we have 
to equip people who have been marginalized or groups or individuals that have been exploited or have been in some way excluded from the mainstream. It is the most powerful tool we have to subvert the hierarchies of power that have kept them down. Um, so I, I see liberal education in its, in its kind of original conception as a liberatory practice, um, as, a, as a practice of equipping individual to live a life of freedom, to win and attain their own liberation. Jenna, you're muted. Some background noise, thank you. Um, let me ask you one more question before I pass this um, back to my husband. Um, you had some interesting speculation in the book um, about the difficulties that colleges and universities are having starting and uh, continuing productive conversations about what it is that belongs in the core, what it is that students need to know and learn in their four years in the institution. And you speculate that one of the things that makes these deb debates so so difficult is that they're, as you say, likely to be had in moral terms, um, not between what's educationally good or bad, this is your language, but is ethically pure or corrupt, right? So it makes an argument that, uh, it makes that argument actually rather unpleasant because, because it becomes a battle of good versus evil and people end up wanting to avoid it altogether, right? So that's part of your theory of why we're not offering robust core curricula as much anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you two questions about this. Just tell us a little bit more about this. Where do you see this? Why do you think this is a factor in the decline of core curriculum education in universities today? And then what could faculty or administrators do to make campus conversation about things like great books education or core education more meaningful and productive? Thank you. Um, very, I think, kind of key questions that that you raise. Um, so the canon, um, th this traditional canon that I, that I call great books, um, obviously reflects uh, our history, including some of its most unpleasant, unpleasant facts. Uh, the most obvious one is that the canon, and this is not just peculiar to what one might, what one might call Western civilization, it's the case uh, pretty much in every uh, civilization that has left a, a, a literate trace, a, a tradition of, of text, that those uh, are dominated by by male. So that is the first kind of major um, and obvious uh, form of exclusion that is encoded, that's embodied, it's is 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 uh, incarnated in the very existence of the canon. Women have been excluded. Um, from access to the tools of intellectual production throughout our history. Um, not only women, but non-elites of every kind, um, people, foreigners, uh, the poor, um, clearly disabled or non-conformist non of, of every sort. In the United States, with our history of, of racial um, oppression and subjugation, um, that those distinctions have a skin color so that in the United States, you have African-Americans who have been denied access to the tools of, of, of production and, and uh, people of color in general. Um, so there is this, this sense that the canon somehow um, encodes I think in, a, in, in, in the most um, narrow-minded reading promotes these values. So people have um, often criticized the canon for the, mor the moral shortcomings of our social past. Um, so um, that moral critique, that critique that says to read let's say Shakespeare, to read is to uh, be somehow promoting a Eurocentric, colonial, male-centric, probably racist, probably patriarchal way of understanding and seeing the world. Um, so there has been a moral social justice critique attached to the, a critique of the canon. So we're not going to 
critique Shakespeare because he's a bad poet, because he doesn't really illuminate our human experience. We're not going to criticize Shakespeare because he is an insignificant figure in the shaping of the English language, of our sensibilities, of literary history. We're going to reject Shakespeare because he's somehow ideologically tainted. That, um, that critique has become actually quite powerful and quite dominant in higher education today. Now, I'm stating a kind of extreme extreme version of it, although you will find you will find that version out there. Uh, but the whole um, uh, kind of uh, approach to asking of the past, particularly of the works that are embodied in the canon, to pass a, a kind of test of moral purity from our standpoint before they're worthwhile objects of attention to uh, for our students. Um, that, th th that paradigm has been absolutely destructive to, um, to the study of the great books. And it has also, and you, you, you allude to this in your, in, your, um, in your question, Jenna, it has made people shy away from uh, a, a full-throated defense of, say, the worth of Aristotle. Because if you defend, say, we should study Aristotle, Aristotle is worth our attention. Every undergraduate should have a serious intellectual encounter with Aristotle. Somebody might come and say, well, you know, Aristotle supports slavery. Aristotle thinks that women are, are barely human, kind of subhuman. Um, maybe you have an investment in advancing those ideas too, that you are defending Aristotle the way you are. So um, that kind of... Um, it's almost like a high voltage um, uh, danger of promoting, embracing, advocating for the study of these of these ancient books have has really made people, even people who kind of privately want and do teach them, has made them shy for, from from promoting them, from advancing them. What can we do as faculty uh, as faculty members? Um, I think the first thing we need to do is to realize that and embrace that part of our function within the university that concerns undergraduate education. I mean, part of our function, especially in a research university is to engage in research, is to uh, write um, uh, articles or produce works that engage with the scho scholarly conversation. And that's really addressed to scholars. And, and it, in, in some cases it will produce knowledge that, is, that, that filters down to a general uh, to the to the general reader, uh, but that's one function. But there is another function, a function that I think constitutes really the soul of the university, the function that no other institution can fulfill, and that has to do with undergraduate education. So first is that we as faculty member ought to clarify for ourselves what priority, what uh, degree of centrality our purpose of educating undergraduates is going to occupy. Once we uh, embrace that to some extent, then the next question is, what is our responsibility as scholars in presenting these undergraduates with a coherent account of what from our past is most worth knowing and studying? That is a responsibility that has been shirked. Um, we do not want to have that conversation. People do not have the com uh, do not want to have a conversation or come up with a reasonable, thought out, not ultimate, not inalterable, not with a claim to absolute authority, but a provisional vision that we present to our students of what about our past is most worth their attention. They want that from us and it is our job and we are the only ones who are positioned in a place that can offer such a thought through account of what is most worthwhile knowing from our cultural past. That's a that's a that's a very important argument, and I I think one that that many faculty um, neglect. I want to I want to turn now to some of the responses that <clears throat> the polemical elements of your book have uh, have generated. So, rescuing Socrates has been widely received. Uh, excuse me, widely reviewed response has been overwhelmingly positive and you've touched a lot of nerves and you've you've won a lot of fans but there have been some criticisms and I'd, I'd like to give you a chance to to respond to some of these 
So the first comes from uh, Harvard English professor Louis Menand. Writing in The New Yorker, Menand takes exception to your argument that professional practitioners of liberal education have corrupted their activity by subordinating the fundamental goals of education to specialized academic pursuits. That's, that's a quote he takes from, from Rescuing Socrates. And he notes that the humanities are already in decline, that with English majors down um, something like 25% between 2012 and 2019, which is really just the tail end of a much longer decline that stretches all the way back to the 1970s at least. So I think what Manand is saying is that you're hitting humanities when they're already down. The, um, how do you respond to this kind of argument? That was such an, an interesting um an interesting take on my book by Menand, and it's it it if you if you if you look at at his review and and you read my book, there's there's much that's unrecognizable about the claims he makes about uh, my position. Um, but but in this he is correct. In this he does put his finger on a fundamentally different vision that we have of the purposes of undergraduate liberal or general education. Um, Menand, and, and this is a mainstream view, a mainstream view among academics, thinks of the humanities and, and the liberal arts as being primarily engaged in the business of, of knowledge production. He calls it the knowledge business. Um, and his vision of undergraduate liberal education is as concerned primarily with expertise, primarily with the uh, generation and dissemination of knowledge. My vision of undergraduate liberal education concerns itself primarily with the cultivation of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a fundamentally different view. What are we about? Are we, are, are we about generating new knowledge in the humanistic fields or are we about equipping individuals to live maximally fulfilling human lives? Mm -hmm. um, now, those two aren't entirely separable. Because in order to, to, to promote this larger vision of human cultivation, you do need to engage with knowledge. You do need, you do need to engage, with, engage and train students in critical thinking and methods of interpretation, give them a sense of historical, uh, a historically accurate sense of the past, et cetera. So there's a lot of knowledge uh, production, um, manipulation, analysis that goes into this more fundamental task of liberal education that has to do with equipping an individual for with the tools to live a free life. Mm. Um, so in our, the, the contrast between our view is that in my view, the student is at the center of the liberal education endeavor. And in his view, the subject, the discipline is at the center of the endeavor. In my view, it is his, um, approach and paradigm that is uh, that has contributed to the decline of the humanities. Because the fact is that most of our students are not interested and should not be interested in the kinds of specialized disciplinary questions that a PhD in literature allows you to, uh, to uniquely address. Uh, it's not relevant to them, it doesn't matter to them. And when they come to a liberal arts classroom and that's what they get, they're likely not to return. However, if they get an education that is focused on the ways in which the great ideas in philosophy, the great debates in history, the great achievements of the human imagination illuminate our understanding of the world and our understanding of ourselves. If that's what they get in the liberal arts classroom, then I think many more of them will be kind of turned on and ignited into whether pursuing that um, as majors or more courses or simply to establishing a lifelong relationship with this life of the mind that ultimately is what we want to encourage. Let me, uh, let, let me remind our viewers that you can submit questions the, uh, for, uh, for Roosevelt Montas uh, to the email address jackson.walford at aei.org or tweet them to hashtag rescuing Socrates AEI. Uh, your, your, your last response reminds me of another uh, criticism that was leveled at your book. This, was, this one comes from George Will, who is in general very favorable to rescuing Socrates, but he has, a, um, he has one uh, sharp line the, um, uh, that, he, that he directs at it. And he says, 
that um, and what he's taking aim at is your contention that the primary aim of liberal education is the search for self-knowledge. And he writes that the young should not be encouraged to have more of what they spontaneously have, a high ratio of interest in themselves uh, to, to more substantive things. The, uh, so what would, you, what would you say in response to this um, more friendly critique? To, yeah. Um, uh, this, this, the, the, to, but, but that says that um, th this version of liberal education focused on self-knowledge kind of contributes to what one might call the natural narcissism of the young. Um, you know, I think that, that, that the simple um, answer is that there is a distinction between the pursuit of self-knowledge and the uh, egoic, narcissistic interest in oneself. Um, I think of, you know, it's a Zen master who's, who, who, who says that to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. Um, or, you know, more in the Western tradition, Socrates' injunction that the unexamined life is not worth living. The thing I love about that is that he doesn't say that the life which having been examined doesn't arrive at an answer is not worth living, right? The, the life that he is calling us to is a life of examination. It's a life where, that, that, where the life is in the questions. The life is in the pursuit um, and all of the thinkers I, I discuss, St. Augustine, Socrates himself, Freud, Gandhi, the more they study their self, the more the self emerges as a, a stellar incognita, the more it emerges as a place of mystery, as a place of continuous unfolding revelation of what your inner life is like, of what the world um, as, as, as seen from your eyes is like. So um, I don't mean the study of the self in the way that a kind of neurotic, self-obsessed um, individual might just be concerned with um, his or her own prerogatives. I mean that in ourselves, in our interiority, lie the keys, lies the answer to all of the questions. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite thinkers of all time is Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Ralph Waldo Emerson has a famous line that he says, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Yeah. Um, nothing at last satisfies us but a kind of inner certainty, a kind of inner conviction about whatever it is. So ultimately, it is that inner work um, where, all the, where all the action happens. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think George will simply... Um, in, in his inimitable way, takes the opportunity to take a shot of what it takes to be the, the, the excessive narcissism of today's young people. Uh, he likes to do that, but I think that um, it is not that which I celebrate, but something much more deeper and much more consequential. Let me just, uh, I just want to draw attention to one thing about the book here that's very refreshing, is how seriously you take the young people who show up in your classrooms. You take them to be serious people who are asking serious questions that the books you put in front of them help them ask. The, and I think that's a, um, that's a refreshing point of view and uh, when we're so often preoccupied by debates between boomers and snowflakes uh, that, that you know, I don't think you see, you don't, you don't regard either in those kinds of condescending terms. Thank you. I, you know, and I think that's really, really key to the, to the task of a liberal art teacher. A liberal arts teacher cannot teach except as a function of a kind of devotion, as a kind of respect, even a kind of love to their students. I, I, I simply could not teach the liberal arts. I could, I could teach my specialty to anybody who, who, who will submit themselves to it. Um, I can do it online, teach my, my field of scholarly specialty. I can just lecture to a recording device and use that to educate. Um, uh, people, but liberal education, this work of cultivation of an individual as a unique and particular, um, irreducible subjectivity, I cannot do that unless I love the student. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think any teacher can do it unless they love the student. And the student needs to love you back. Um, that affective connection. And you know, it's, I'm not. I didn't come up with this. You can even see it, like in the symposium. That 
um, effective connection between teacher and student um, is, is fundamental to, to liberal education. As I said before, liberal education is something that happens between people. Um, not something that that just happens from um, from books or from or from or from just the intellect. The whole the whole person is engaged in this process. Jenna, did you want to ask one more, or shall I? Okay. Oh, I'd be happy to if we have time. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right, then uh, let me ask the last question while you, um, Ben, I think, proves the questions from the audience. Is that, is that right? Okay. So um, I'm just going to, that, that was a, that was beautiful, uh, Roosevelt, and I was, I was writing some of what you said down. So, um, and I think that uh, you give a, a really lovely account of the way that liberal education has to be <clears throat> formed in the context of a personal relationship. I just want to bring this to conclude back one more time to, to the political dimension of what you're saying though. Um, Cause as you were talking earlier about the leveling function, you call it um, that offering a great books education can have and how that leveling function is particularly important in a democracy where we expect everybody to um, understand the way that our world is structured um, in, a, in a way that prepares them to participate in its rule. I find that argument very compelling. Um, but I also think that, you know, even in our democracy, you don't do away with the fact that certain people have more power and privilege and responsibility than others, right? Or different kinds, kinds over larger scale things. And so I'm wondering uh, not only about the leveling function of the great books, which I, which I think is a good argument that you make, but also about the elevating function, I might call it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in particular, you know, what are you doing at Columbia in the core curriculum to help uh, students there who are after all at a very elite institution, right? Headed, in, headed to be, um, at the top of whatever fields or, or businesses or what have you that they go into, what are you doing to to train them to be a responsible um, member of an elite class? We don't even like mm -hmm. to think of ourselves that way, but the fact mm -hmm. is some of us are elites, right? Yeah. What do you do? What do yeah. the great books teach um, people about how to use that kind of privilege well? Thank you. Um, I, I think that it's, you raise a set of issues that are so important um, in our educational system. We, you know, we are in a in a in a kind of brutally exclusive and hierarchical landscape of of higher education. Students are are you know ranked um, very decidedly um, as high school students, and 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 that determines to a large extent what institutions they go to. And and places like Columbia are um, at, at the top of the heap. Um, and I sometimes remark how kind of counter-cultural the activity of the core curriculum is. Um, it, it seems that we select, not just at Columbia, but at all, at all highly selective undergraduate institutions, we select for qualities that we then, with a liberal education, try to unwind. Yeah. Um, that is, there is a kind of you know, goal-oriented, driven, uh, often great grubbing, um, fixed um, determination to, to achieve and to maximize your time, to be efficient, to build your resume. I mean, you need to be like a, an Olympic athlete, uh, student-wise, like an, an, an Olympic student to get into, into some of these schools. And then in the core curriculum, we say, wait, um, maybe the system of values that has brought you here is hollow. Maybe the, 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 this, the brutal... Uh, competitive world in the top, uh, the top of whose heap you lie, is uh, is a sham. Maybe that in fact doesn't. Um, maybe that's hollow. Maybe that doesn't um, satisfy and and uh, address your um, kind of your, your fundamental well being or your or your your fundamental search for for meaning and a a, a good life. Um, now. You know, I, I, I often say we in, in a course or two or three or four are not going to undo a whole a whole cultural, a whole um, in some ways consensus, dominant, dominant ethos. But what we can achieve is to sow some doubt. 
what we can achieve is to propose a, an alternative way of looking at your own life and a skeptical um, orientation towards the certainties, towards the uh, givens, towards the assumptions, the cultural assumptions that drive our late capitalist or capitalist um, capitalist society. One other thing that that I think this kind of education does is that it emphasizes the contingency of your privilege. Um, you know, part of the perniciousness of the hyper-competitive environment that we have is that people who succeed then falsely believe they have earned that success. People who are at Columbia feel, well, I'm here because I deserve it. I'm here because I worked hard. I'm here because I'm smart. I'm here because I'm better. And then they uh, go on to careers in which they can think of their successes as expressions of their merit. One of the things that an education like this does is to highlight the contingency, the accidental um, fortune of your, of your own privilege. Um, and we're all people who are, I often say it, people who are um, at Columbia, we say, I, I point out, I remind them that we are all in the 1%. We are the global 1% sitting right here. Um, I try to bring their attention to the kind of um, irony or contradictions of their own commitments to social justice. I um, Sometimes I say um, they're a one-line joke. One-line jokes are very rare because um, jokes usually require a setup and a punchline. But a one-line joke is Colombia students marching against gentrification. Um, <laughs> So, you know, Columbus is in the middle of kind of wedged between Harlem and Washington Heights, two uh, underprivileged, um, under-resourced poor communities. And uh, yet many of our students are, are, are out there um, exercised against gentrification. So bringing self-awareness to that condition, um, it's one of the things that this education does by placing our particularity in this much larger context, in this much larger context of history and debate and ideology. One more thing is that part of the magic of a core classroom, even at Columbia, um, Columbia, like like many many wealthy institutions, does have some commitment to bringing low income people as part of the class. That's how I ended up at Columbia. And one of the extraordinary things of in a core classroom is that you do, in the best of circumstances, end up with real diversity. That is, you end up with people who have really different understandings of the world based on their experiences, and you get them to talk about fundamental issues. You get them to talk honestly and directly about the grounding questions of our humanity and of society. Um, rather than, you know, there's many campuses who, that, I, that, I, that are diverse. Students just self-segregate. And, you know, particular kinds of students take particular classes. The athletes all run to one class and the Latinos will run to one major um, or sit in the same place in the cafeteria or join the same clubs. There is this natural self-segregation. The core classroom is the place, you know, the, the liberal arts classroom is the place where our campuses can realize the potential of our diversity. Hmm. Let me turn now to a couple of questions from our viewers. The first one is from Jeff Schertz, who asks, uh, Professor Montas, you, you mentioned that the end of liberal education is the student's liberation. Liberation from what? And liberation for what? Great. Um, I'll, I'll give a metaphor or, or an image, um, and it's, it's not my own. Um, uh, but we all live under certain, certain constraints. Some of them have to do with our social commitments, with our family relations, some of them, of them have to do with the socioeconomic conditions that we grew up, the cultural religious commitments that we have, the expectations that others have. Some are just are, are simply cognitive. Um, we come with a particular kind of uh, uh, mind. Um, liberal education, and, and we cannot escape that. We are we we are we are constrained and determined in all kinds of ways. Um, you might think of 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 of, of, of human life as, as being we live in a cage. Um, we live in a cage whose boundaries we did not create. And so when you think about it that way, 
liberal education is a way of expanding the floor of the cage. And that's, that, that's the image, right? Expanding the floor of the cage. That is to increasing the self-awareness, incre increasing the latitude that you have um, given constraints that we all live with. I um, mean, you know, it's a basic insight of Freud and probably most, most directly expressed in civilization and its discontents, that the possibility of civilization the possibility of collective action depends on the repression, constraining, the binding of a lot of things in, in, in ourselves that are natural, uh, natural desires, natural ambitions, natural uh, drives. We must constrain and um, bind them in order to achieve collective action. Um, it's one of the ways in which, in which we are constrained. Liberal education is a way of maximizing our freedom within the constraints that are inevitable in human existence. Um, so liberate you from what? In some ways, it is liberating you from constraints that come with your condition of being human. Liber liber liberating you from, for what? Liberating you to maximally develop your human capacities, to maximally, uh, you know, there's a, there's a quote in, in Rousseau where he says that to be driven by appetite is slavery, and to obey the laws that we have formulated for ourselves is freedom. This notion that to be driven by appetite is slavery, that we can be enslaved, we can be, our liberty can be uh, robbed by a kind of disordered desire, a kind of disordered way of wanting things can actually limit our freedom. Well, liberal education is one way to bring order to the economy of desires and the economy of psychic forces that sometimes constrain, constrain us and sometimes rob us of our liberty. Mm. One more question from our audience. This is from John Soliday. What role should American studies and Judeo-Christian religious education play in the core curriculum? He asks. American studies and Judeo-Christian religious education. Um, and I, I assume that the question is in a core curriculum in the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I think that, that the Western tradition is worth special attention within, within the United States is because so many aspects of our culture, our institutions, our laws, our aesthetics, our, our, our language, um, our, the idioms of our, of our um, social life have a history, uh, much of which has, can be traced and understood and, and, and clarified. Um, in this lineage that we call the Western tradition. That includes Judeo-Christian values. So, um, or, 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 which, and if you're talking about text, you know, the biblical text. Um, now, we don't teach those as indoctrination. We don't teach them to indoctrinate you into them. Uh, we teach them to, again, clarify where we are, um, to understand more deeply what they mean and how they relate to the way the world is today. If you believe him or not, it's a, it's a, it's a private, it's a, it, it, it's a private faith issue. Liberal education is not about giving you the answers. Liberal education is about clarifying the questions. Similarly, uh, it goes for American studies that in an American university, I think there is an American core, an American canon that includes, you know, the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, but also it includes Frederick Douglass, probably Fourth of July speech, and 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 it includes uh, the, the voices that articulate how American values um, uh, interface with our diversity and the ways in which we have failed to, um, to to enact our values and the battles that we have fought in order to bring those ideals into into closer uh, reality. So there is a kind of a of American core that I think ought to be part of the general education of a student in an American institution, particular, particularly a student who is going to live and be part of the American, American democracy. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Roosevelt Montas, for joining us today. We've reached the end of our hour and let me thank all of our viewers also for, for tuning in and, and commend to everybody Roosevelt Montes' wonderful book, uh, Rescuing Socrates, the, uh, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation. Thank you. Thank you.